Russia when the Bolsheviks took power in Russia. So it's about a hundred years. Uh, China and Russia performed differently under these, uh, 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 these socialist regimes. And also to look at the perspective of 500 years. Why 500 years? Because as I would argue later, uh, and this is basically a fact, there is nothing to argue about, uh, the, since 1500, in 1500, all countries were at the same level of economic development. If you don't know, this is one of the major stylized facts in economic history. And since 1500, countries started to diverge. In today's dollars, or better to say in dollars of 2005, the key authority on the issue is Angus Madison, uh, uh, an economist who just died recently. He had the tables of GDP per capita for all the countries since the year zero. Since the year zero, if you want to know what was the ratio of China to Roman Empire, yes, you can figure out looking at medicine tables. And they are based, actually, when I was studying my career, I tried to check, I tried to check these tables based on novels. San Go, the famous novel of the uh, Chinese literature, Three Kingdoms, has meticulous description of what were the bribes that were given and the salaries of the small officials of the period which is described there is basically the period of the beginning of uh, our era, third century uh, of our era, and uh, uh, three kingdoms, and uh, uh, actually it turns out $500 a year. $500 a year is a major figure, five, $600 a year, GDP per capita, in dollars of 2005 or 1995. This was the level of all the countries. And the Roman legionnaire, uh, of the rank of lieutenant in uh, southern Germany in the first century of our era was getting the same $500. I was checking it personally and I was surprised to figure out the proportions between olive oil and uh, wheat price proportions and uh, gold, but not silver, they remained the same. Silver and gold changed dramatically. But if you transfer it into the kilos or pounds of uh, wheat or olive or bushels of uh, wheat or, and olive oil, then it's pretty much the same. The salaries were pretty much the same. And uh, this is what other comparisons tell us. Right? My comparison is not very important, but uh, the, uh, uh, all the uh, sources that we have point out to the same fact, $500 per capita. And then countries started to diverge. The West was the first to take off. Then Latin America and Eastern Europe, including Russia and South Africa, and uh, some other countries started to catch up. Uh, East Asia and South Asia were staying at the same level until 1950, virtually at the same level of $500 per capita. And then they started to catch up also. So the book is called Mixed Fortunes. In English, fortune is a very important word. In other languages, at least in my native language, which is Russian, uh, fortune has three translations. And there is no one word for fortune. Fortune is destiny something that you know, is predetermined in your life, or maybe depends on you, or maybe depends on the upper forces. And the uh, fortune is the fortune that you inherit, if you're lucky, from your parents, yes, money. And fortune is also uh, luck, yes, it's your chance in this life. I mean, fortunate, right, you see. So this fortune in Russian is translated by three different words, in French, I think, also, so there is a problem to translate it. But that's why there, the, the book is called Mixed Fortunes. Countries go up and down in the economic development. First, Russia was catching up faster than China, and now China is catching up faster than Russia. So the question is why, in the short term, in the long term. Let me come to the short term. Eventually, I will, uh, the structure of the talk is such that I would argue that the short term cannot be understood without the medium term, and the medium term cannot be understood without the long term. And it's my understanding that we'll not be able to cover everything. Yes, we usually, uh, you know, people who, uh, approach uh, their retirement, they like to talk about global problems, right? So I won't be able to tell you all, but uh, I will try to be provocative and to formulate the questions. And it's, I think I'm expected to speak about 40 to 45 minutes to one hour. We'll see how it goes. If you have questions, right? Let me speak for 40 minutes. If you have questions, you know, which pertain to exactly that issue, please don't hesitate to jump in and to, to ask. But in 40 minutes, in 45 minutes, I'll try to stop, right, and try to take your questions and try to adjust. Because basically, I'm an economist. I understand most of you are not economists, but I'm the economist that is interested in economic history. So, you know, I feel better with political scientists and uh, uh, people in international affairs and uh, uh, and uh, uh, sociologists also. Yes. So, uh, basically, I'm on the village of these disciplines. So, what are the stylized facts in the short term? If we look at the recent 30 years for China. The transition started in 1979. 
1978 in December, there was a planning of Central Committee that Chalpin was there. So the transition started in 1979. This transition continued reforms for at least, you know, they continue even now, yes, but for, for 10 years there was a gradual transition to the market in China. In the former Soviet Union, the transition started, some people say, in 1986. Uh, Gorbachev came to power in 85, in 86 there were some reforms enacted, but basically they started either in 1989 when there were market, the first program to make a transition to the market was actually in 1990 even, or in 1992, in 1991, at the end of the year, the Soviet Union fell apart, and in 1992, excuse me, Russia enacted the program of the market, radical market reforms. So it's, in, in Eastern Europe it started in 1990, in Poland, or in 1991, in the rest of Eastern Europe. In 1989, you know, the Berlin Wall went down, so basically it's about 25 years in Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, and maybe about, uh, say, uh, 35 years in China, since, ni since 1979. So why this transition different? The three most important stylized facts about this transition were the following. China and Vietnam, here we see 1989, if you put 1979, this chart would be exactly the same. China and Vietnam were growing before transition, when they were centrally planned economies, and their growth rates accelerated. China was growing at 5%, Chinese growth rate since 1979 became 10%. Uh, Vietnam, not that impressive, it was growing at 5%, it went to 6 to 7%. Also, acceleration of development. This is how it should be, right? You introduce reforms in order to reap the benefits of reforms, so they went up. Their growth rates increased. Eastern Europe went into the recession, which is called transformational recession. Transformational recession continued in Eastern Europe. Here we see some countries of uh, Asia. Let us look at the economies of Eastern Europe and Mongol. Yes, Eastern Europe, this is what we need. The recession in Eastern Europe was 20 on average, as a rule of thumb, 20 to 30 percent reduction of output in the course of two, three, four, five years. In Bulgaria and Romania it was, uh, uh, the magnitude of recession was larger. In East European countries, Central European countries, five. Poland, Slovenia, uh, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary. These are the <laughs> European countries. Uh, and eastern part of the uh, of Germany, GDR, German Democratic Republic, they performed a bit better, the recession was shorter, but basically this magnitude of recession, the recession is very large by international standards. To remind you, in 1929-33, Great Depression in the United States, output went down by 30% from 29 to 32, and GDP, and uh, annual GDP by 30% down. This is the huge uh, recession, which is even called depression. And industrial output, monthly industrial output, from the highest point to the lowest point, right, went down by 50%. But GDP by 20%, so this is like a Great Depression. Right? This was like a Great Depression in East European countries. And in former Soviet Union, this was even worse. In the former Soviet Union, you have the reduction of output in some countries by 50%, by 40, by 60% even, and in some even by 70%. 70% reduction of output means you are producing 100 bicycles and now you produce 30 bicycles, right? So the production goes down dramatically overall your GDP. And yes, some countries were affected by conflicts, yes, like Moldova, for instance, or Georgia, Kyrgyzstan, uh, but others were not affected by conflicts and the military conflicts, I mean. And the reduction of output in those countries was extraordinary. Now, uh, these are the three side aspects, so we have to explain why there was no recession in East Asian countries that were making a transition to communism, to, from communism to market economy. Why the recession in uh, former Soviet Union countries was deeper than in East European countries? And of course there is a whole bunch of theories. And conventional wisdom, I would say even now conventional wisdom, uh, was that once you have radical reforms, uh, shock therapy type, you do everything at once. You, if you want to transform your economy, you have to uh, do it at once, because if you don't do it at once, then you get into the period where rules are murky, and you don't know, some rules are uh, from the old period, the new rules are from the new period, right, the, so the other rules are from the new period, and this creates a mess, right, so if you don't do it at once, then you actually suffer a lot, right, this was a general idea, there were nice comparisons, you know, that's, uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, go from right-hand side driving to left-hand side driving, or uh, uh, from left-hand side to right-hand side, you cannot go street by street, right? This is going to be a mess. You go just, you know, in all the country, in all the city, you change it right away, the rules. And they would say that's the reason why in the former Soviet Union, 
the recession was deeper than in Eastern Europe. East Europeans had the guts to bite the bullet, right? And uh, I recently found out that the expression to bite the bullet comes from uh, uh, the civil war in the United States, uh, when there were no anesthetics to prevent people from uh, a pain shock, right? Uh, because you were cutting the limbs without any anesthetics, and so people were breaking their teeth. And not to break their teeth, you give them the bullet, because this is soft metal in the army. What else? What other soft metal you give? So you give this uh, lead, the bullets were made out of lead, you give the bullet so when you clinch your teeth because of pain, you don't uh, break your teeth. But anyway, probably you know it, but for me it was a discovery. It's just a piece of information that I wanted to share. Anyway, they had the guts to buy the bullet, and that's why the recession was shorter, and uh, uh, the recession was not so deep. And in the former Soviet Union, they did not have the guts to buy the bullet. They did it piece by piece, one reform this year, the other reform the other year, and so the reduction of output was uh, longer, uh, more protracted reduction of output. But those who support gradualism say exactly the opposite. See, China did gradualist strategy, and that's why China did not have any recession. And then uh, those guys in Eastern Europe that uh, carried out reforms, they uh, suffered because they uh, uh, did it all at once. Uh, so uh, I would say both theories are actually wrong. And uh, of course, I know the, the answer. Yes, <laughs> I claim to know the answer. I have a number of articles. If you look at the at today's, you know, the today perspective looks very different. Look at the countries which are ahead of all the others in terms of transition, right? Uh, GDP in 1989 is 100%. It went down, then it went up. This is the line for five, average line, unweighted average for five East European countries. And these are the leaders of transition. Previously, they said Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, these are procrastinators, authoritarian regimes, notorious, you know. Kazakhstan, also pretty, Al Belarus, the last dictatorship in Europe, as they call it, right? And they're all doing, you know, better than the others, right? Poland pains in comparison with Turkmenistan. Yes, Turkmenistan has gas, yes, this is very true. But, you know, other countries also have some gas, right? Like Russia, for instance, and Russia is not doing, you know, that well. And countries that are on top of the list, if you look at the one of the indicators of reforms. What is the share of the private sector? How fast the economies were privatized? Well, what are the economies that are not privatized at all? Turkmenistan, Belarus, Uzbekistan, all the others are over 50%. Even Tajikistan is over 50%, right? But uh, no, we've seen these economies just on the previous chart, Uzbekistan, Belarus, and Turkmenistan, right? If we go back to the previous chart, this is exactly the economies that are performing better than the others, right? And Uzbekistan is, uh, you know, Belarus doesn't have any resources. Uzbekistan has the resources, but it's self-sufficient. You recently became self-sufficient in energy. I'm working currently in Uzbekistan. Their performance looks very impressive, right? Uh, it's second only to China. In recent uh, 10 years, they were growing at 8%. Uh, very good economic policy. Uh, quite a number of successes, creating competitive water industry. The only country, I have an article about Uzbekistan, which is called Economic Miracle. Right? In Uzbekistan, you have actually the only miracle in post Soviet space. The only country that managed to carry out successful industrial strategy, like China, created the water industry from scratch. Right? There was not a single car produced in Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is a country of 30 million people in Central Asia. Right? There was not a single car produced in Uzbekistan in 1992, even. They invited Korean capital, Deo. Uh, then Deo went bankrupt, and then it was General Motors. But at all times, the uh, uh, auto industry was controlled by state owned companies that had 51% of the shares. Now it's not only cars that they produce, now it's also engines. They're producing parts for the cars. They, they're producing 200,000 ca 200, cars, exporting 100,000 cars, which is a success. Not a single, except for China and Vietnam, not a single country upgraded their exports to that extent as Uzbekistan did. Their share of machinery and equipment in total industrial output increased, their share of uh, ready-made goods in total, uh, uh, in in total exports also increased. Uh, so Uzbekistan looks uh, pretty impressive. Uh, so the question is why? Yes, why it is the case that uh, you know, we see that uh, 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 some countries which are carrying out more gradual reforms succeed, and the other explanation is that countries that carried out uh, uh, Shock therapy reforms succeed, so initially it looked like uh, the later statement was the case, now it looks like the other statement was the case. So where is the theory? The theory is, uh, if I can get to the theory, well, before we get to the theory, let me tell you that you probably know, I don't know. Let me skip a number of uh, slides, but just to let you know that I can you know, elaborate on that if you would be interested. 
there was a huge increase in inequality in all the countries. Right? Uh, in China, it was as large as in, um, say, former Soviet Union countries. In East European countries, it was a little bit more limited. But it was more limited, say, in Uzbekistan and Belarus, it was more limited, the increase in inequality. And in countries like uh, uh, you know, Ch Russia, Ukraine, uh, uh, Central Asian countries, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, China, the increase in inequality was very large. And uh, uh, the, uh, in China there was a period uh, until 1985 when there was no increase in inequality. This was the first, uh, the period of agricultural reforms, agricultural liberalization. Then they carried out reforms in industry, then inequality increased. If you want the number of billionaires, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the number of billionaires because all measures of inequality, uh, they don't take into account inequality at the very top and inequality at the very bottom because they're based on surveys. This is income, surveys about income. They are uh, doing the representative sample and they are asking you what is your income and, uh, you know, other questions. And this is, the Gini coefficient is based on this kind of surveys. And this surveys, billionaires never answer questions and homeless never answer questions. So we don't know what is at the very top or at the very bottom. And this is a very important, very important part of inequality. So, you know, you can count billionaires and you can see we, I call it uh, oligarch intensity of the economy, right? Oligarchs, this is the word for the wealthy people in former Soviet Union uh, region, and you can calculate what is the number of uh, billionaires per one trillion of GDP, and you can calculate the wealth of billionaires as compared to the total GDP. So it gives you some kind of a measure. So of course countries like you know Georgia and Ukraine and Russia, uh, they stand out of the crowd. Uh, China is, uh, you know, nothing as compared to those countries, even though the number of billionaires in China is large, but Chinese economy is larger, of course, right? So the relative size of the billionaires. So previously, you know, just imagine, in Russia you have 110 billionaires and there was not a single billionaire in 1996. Even in 1996 there was not a single billionaire. Ten years passed and somehow, you know, nearly, you know, 10% of the GDP, right, is the head of the billionaires, right? It's, uh, it's an impressive redistribution of wealth that happened. And of course, there was an increase in deterioration in all social indicators. If you're interested, I can go deeper than that into it. I uh, have papers on figuring out what are the factors for the mentality crisis in transition economies. Econometric papers evaluating the factors, right? What factors contributed to the huge rise in mortality. Uh, here we see the increase in crime rate and murder rate, right? And the increase in murder rate, well, just to give you the perspective, it's on the right scale. Now it's down to 10, the murder rate. There are two statistics of murder rate. I can explain to you what is the difference in two statistics. But basically, the general picture is this one. In the United States, it's five, six murders per 100,000 of inhabitants. In Europe, in East Asia, in Japan, in MENA countries, Middle East and North Africa countries, one to three. One to three murders per 100,000 of inhabitants. In South, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, former Soviet Union, 10, 20, 30. In Latin America, the highest would be 60 in Colombia sometime, or even 70 in Colombia. But this is basically, after 70, it's the war. It's the war in a country when the central government disintegrates. There is no country, which we know, which stays in one piece. It goes to the robber barons, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the warlords, excuse me, not the robber barons, the, the warlords. It goes to the level of warlords. Once it gets higher than 50, it's already, you know, the warlord country. It's not, there's no, there's no war in the at all. So, uh, this, uh, ratio went in Russia, for instance, from 6 to 7 per 100,000 inhabitants to 32 at the high of the, uh, at the highest point, it was about 32 here, I guess. And uh, then it went uh, down, now it went down to 10. So this Putin regime was associated with some stabilization, with a decline in the number of murders. That's a general picture. In the former Soviet Union, the story is very different because countries which have more traditional structures, uh, for instance, Azerbaijan, Georgia, uh, Armenia, Caucasian republics. Uh, doesn't matter, one is, you know, two of them are Christian, one is Muslim, but the traditional structures, they contribute to all the crime. So they have one, two, three, right? One, five, maybe, right? Central Asia, except for Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan is on the verge because there is large population, uh, non-Kazakh population in Ka Kazakhstan. Uh, they have uh, also one, two, three, right? But uh, countries like Baltic states, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia, uh, Moldova, Kazakhstan, they had uh, previously had higher crime and the increase was high. But anyway, this, this is the separate development. If you look at the mortality, uh, murder rates, the murder rate increased. This is 87, murder rate in 87. This is the murder rate in 2002, pretty much the highest point. 
for most of the countries. In East European countries, there was some increase, but not that pronounced. But in former Soviet Union countries, the increase was very large. So, uh, you know, if uh, this is the 45 uh, degrees line. It's not 45 degrees because the scale is different here, and the scale is different here. So here, for instance, we have four, and here four would be, say, five and five, right? Five and five, and this is 40. If the point is below the line or on the line, there was no increase. If the point is higher, there was an increase, right? So uh, you can see that uh, for the former Soviet Union, these points are considerably higher. Now you look at the life expectancy. Yes, this is, uh, this is a separate topic, uh, but uh, most people don't know that life expectancy in the former Soviet, in, in Russia, uh, this is life expectancy in Russia. The red line on the right scale, life expectancy in Russia. They don't know that the life expectancy fell below the point of, of 1953, when Stalin was still there. Right? In 1953, the mortality rate was very high uh, by standards of the time because there was a high mortality associated with the labor camps. The labor camps were opened in 56 only, and there was high mortality associated with the consequences of the war. Well, this high mortality looks like nothing as compared to the mortality that uh, was uh, that increased. This is the third mortality crisis in the history of humanity. The first one was five to seven thousand years BC, uh, when there was a transition from uh, Neolithic, from Paleolithic to Neolithic era, it's from, from hunting and gathering when all they age when they die. The second crisis is even better documented during industrialization in Britain, in closure policy and then industrialization in Britain. We have church registrations of deaths, so we know the average age. In the second mortality crisis, life expectancy went down from 45 to 35 in a hundred years, in a hundred years, there was a huge... This is the third mortality crisis. It's a crisis without epidemics, without, uh, uh, you know, in, in, say, in Botswana, in South of Africa, we have AIDS, right? There was also the decline in life expectancy. But without epidemics, without eruption of volcanoes, without, uh, you know, tsunamis, without any this natural disasters, to have, uh, and the reason for the distress, stress of the... There are several theories, but yeah, one's a natural experiment about stress. stress which cannot be reproduced you know, easily. Mostly it's men, 40, 50 years, having heart attack, right? This is the reason for this high mortality. But economists somehow you know, pretend that there is, no, there is no crisis. But medical people, doctors, they think this is very important. Anyway, let me get to the point. So uh, there are quite a number of explanations of this, uh, uh, of this uh, varying performance, different performance in transition economies. And uh, uh, I'm just looking at GDP, uh, and this is what economists do, but there are social aspects to this transformation as well. And uh, uh, you would be uh, most welcome if you want an article. They are all on my site. Yeah, I have a site, I put everything I write on my site. Virtually everything. Some books, the book for instance, is not, but the other book, which you publish in Russian, for instance, they now don't, don't care. They say, put it on the site. So I put everything <laughs> which I'm allowed to put on the site, is put on the site. So uh, the uh, explanation is this one. Uh, I uh, probably will come to the explanation right away without uh, telling you the uh, contradictions. But one of the contradictions, this is just preceding the explanation, I'm telling you what are the contradictions. They say Vietnam and China. Most people think Vietnam is gradual reforms. Well, there are several criteria. Once you deregulate prices at once, and this is what Viet Vietnam did in 1989. They experimented for three years with gradual reforms, pretty much Gorbachev-style reforms, from uh, 86 to 89. And on 1st of April, 1989, uh, the, the course was called Doi Moi, the gradual course. And then on the 1st of April of 1989, they introduced uh, the convertibility of the DOM. Not full convertibility, but they merged several exchange rates that existed, multiple exchange rates. And they deregulated 90% of the prices. For all practical purposes, this is the most important criteria to make a judgment whether it's shock therapy or gradual transition. Chinese gradual transition is based on two important principles. The first one is called the dual track price system. Dual track price system means for the farmer or for the enterprise, we guarantee delivery of the particular goods at state prices. For the farmer, we say, we give you fertilizers, tractors, energy, uh, gasoline at state prices. But you sell 50% of the output to us, to the state, at state prices. The rest, this covers your 50% of your production capacity. Then you have another 50% of your production capacity 
you buy gasoline at whatever prices you want in the market, you produce whatever you want, and you sell at whatever prices you want in the market. And first it was 90%, state order was 90% of your production capacity. Then it was gradually lower and lower. So it took 10 to 15 years gradually to go from state orders to the market economy. So there were two economies functioning side by side. In every enterprise, there were two economies. In every, first it was in the farming, in every culture, this kind of a system. This is called dual track price system. And this was actually the only country that did gradualism with China in classical form. Then there is another criteria. Uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, the uh, prices is the first together with the exchange rate, because exchange rate is about uh, impact of the world prices on your prices, right? And the, the second major uh, Chinese uh, pillar of the Chinese gradual transition is growing out of socialism. Growing out of socialism means you don't privatize. China did not privatize until 1996 at all. And then privatize very carefully, very slowly. And what do you do? You allow the private sector to grow from scratch. And it grows in China, this non-government sector, it was mostly non-private, but TVEs, if you remember, Township and Village Enterprises, these were called. Nobody understood who has the property of these enterprises, but they were definitely non-state enterprises, and they were mushrooming, well, growing like mushrooms. They were mushrooming very, very quickly. And these enterprises grew at a rate, say, in the 1980s, of 23%. And the state enterprises also grew at a rate of 7%. But 7% was not 22. So initially, non state sector was zero. But once you have this kind of a growth, you know, in 10 years, you surprise, surprised non state sector is 50% of your economy, right? So this is called growing out of socialism. This is another pillar of the transition. So the speed of the privatization and other reforms is the unimportant thing. So for all these practical purposes, Vietnamese reformers, uh, uh, because they deregulated prices, right? They uh, were shock therapy reformers. So what do we have? In Asia, we have radio reformer, China, and shock therapy reformer, Vietnam. And uh, in Asia, it seems like it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you grow anyway, right, in Asia. So uh, there should be an explanation for that, right? So here is an explanation. I'm just uh, formulating puzzles. Here, yeah, if you want to compare the index of economic freedom, just another puzzle. The index of economic freedom from the Heritage Foundation, right? If you believe this data, nobody believes them, but if you believe yeah. And uh, see, it's pretty much the same. Right? It was a little bit higher, a little bit lower, China and Russia. But Russian economy was going down and Chinese economy was going up as an arrow. Right? So once again, uh, does it matter? It doesn't matter. Here is my explanation. I did quite a bit of calculations and econometrics to provide this explanation. So basically there are two explanations. There are two major factors that govern the performance of countries in transition. One is called distortions. Distortions may be high and low. What is distortions? This is the non-competitive sector in the central Atlantic economy. What is the non-competitive sector? It's the sector that was created uh, uh, by the planners according to their perceptions what is supposed to be created, right? Basically, it was non-competitive, like machine building, or, you know, say, uh, uh, maybe, um, uh, uh, say, uh, computer industry, right? These computers, you cannot sell it in the world market uh, getting the reasonable price. But they thought that the country should have its own computers because of different you know, political considerations. And they created the sector. And now, say, half of your economy is competitive and when you open up and try to compete in the world markets. And the other half of your economy is totally non-competitive because your productivity levels and your levels of uh, wages are totally out of line. Right? So your level of productivity, for instance, is 1 to 10 to the world market. And your level of wages is 1 to 1. You cannot compete with these wages. Either you bring down the wages or you raise your productivity. Neither this nor that can be done quickly. So you have two sectors, right? You open up, and suddenly you first allow prices to govern the allocation of resources in your economy. Previously, these were the central planets that were allocating the resources. And somebody was operating, say, the mines were operating at a loss. And the losses were covered by central planets because they thought that these mines are important because of particular reasons, right? So once you have these two sectors, then you they regulate prices, you allow prices to regulate distribution of resources in your economy, allocation of resources. And then you allow prices to be dependent on the world prices, so you accept the world price ratios, right? And then it turns out that part of your economy is totally non-competitive, right? That's one of the reasons for the, I'll return to this chapter. This is one of the reasons of the decline and output. This is called the supply side recession, yes? Usually people don't ask the question, and why the recession happened at all? What was wrong with those economies? Why the recession was supposed to happen? Well, one of the major reasons of recession is supply-side recession. Supply-side recession, there are two, demand-side, demand-driven and supply-driven. Supply-side recession happens, for instance, after the war, when you move the resources from defense industry to non-defense, conversion. 
uh, most people don't know, but most serious post-war recession in the United States is 44-45. Why? Because the resources were moved, if you look at the statistics, output fell something like by 10%, I don't recall. And, you know, in recessions, usually the annual output falls by 1 to 3%, right? In post-war recessions, right? There were no recessions deeper than that. But in 45-44, the output fell by 10-15%. And uh, of course, nobody noticed because this was the output of tanks, right? And the resources from the tanks were moved to the production of consumer goods. But the reduction of the production of tanks was going faster than the increase in the production of consumer goods because you cannot move the resources right away. You need time for that, right? So the recession, this is a transformational, typical transformational research. Conversion of defense industry. You had Japan, Europe, United States, former Soviet Union going through the same recession of conversion of defense industry. You look at the numbers for the Soviet Union in 44, 40, 45, the output was lower than in 43 during, during the war because there was a conversion and then there was a rapid growth, right? So this is one of the, if you, just to give you an example, you have, these are the actual numbers in 1995, you have resource sector, there are other sectors also, but yeah, I just look at the two sectors. One is resource sector, fuel, energy and metals. Three million people work there. And you have machinery and equipment and life industry sector. I just uh, took two sectors in the economy. Uh, in uh, 1990, there were 10 million people. Then the sector was contracting, so there was already 6.7. But the point is this one. The point is that in these two sectors, the productivity, labor productivity and capital productivity, as compared to national average, is very different. Here we have three times higher than national average and a little bit lower than the national average. Here we have uh, about half of the national average and about half of the national average. But in all the cases, this sector is more productive. On, in terms of capital, in terms of labor, this sector is more productive. So what is supposed to happen if you're a businessman, where do you invest? You invest here, you invest here. Of course here, right? There's no question about it, right? So this is what was happening. Yes, you deregulate prices, you allow prices to govern the allocation of resources in fuel industry output fell, but not as much as in machinery and equipment. It fell to 37%. And not as much as in light industry. Light industry went from 100 to 13%. It virtually disappeared, right? So 90% of the light industry is textiles. Textiles and footwear. Textiles and footwear in, from 1990 to 1996, just six years, in six years, textile industry disappeared because textile industry was totally uncompetitive. You better invest resources in oil and gas, not in textile industry. Whether it's good for the country, you know, communists would say this is the industri industrialization of the country. Uh, the uh, Republican Party in Russia, or similar to the Republican Party in Russia, would say, well, a guide our party, right? It's called the choice of Russia or, you know, freedom, uh, something that really changed all, all the time it changed. In. Uh, uh, the Union of Right Forces today it's called, but it's similar to the Republican Party in Russia. They say this is bringing the actual industrial structure of the country in line with comparative advantages. Our comparative advantages is oil and gas, we're supposed to produce oil and gas. So the attitude is different, it's political issue about industrial policy. Once again, I can speculate about it. But the fact is that once you allow it to happen, the market will do exactly that. Right? So the market was doing exactly that. You know, if you look at the share of investment that was going to machine building, it was 12% in the former Soviet Union, it went to 6% own of investment, right? And where the investment were going, to fuel and energy from 22 to 38%. So this is natural, yes? The resources go to places where they can be used for the greatest efficiency. Economists love you know, this kind of you know, restructuring taking place. So the point is that these resources go to efficient industries, uh, not instantly. And if it is not instant, then there is a reduction in output in those industries from where resources are taken. And this reduction in output is not compensated by the increase in output to where resources come, to oil and gas, right? So uh, this is what happens. This is a transformational recession. So once you uh, evaluate the distortions, I can explain how distortions in industrial structure and external trade are calculated. I did the calculation of these distortions. Basically, I tried to evaluate for all 30 transition economies uh, the size of non-competitive sector. Once you evaluate the size of non-competitive sector, you notice that the reduction of output that took place is very much linked to the size of non-competitive sector. If your sector was large, if your heritage from the central planned economy was heavy, then you were doing not so good as other countries. China and Vietnam are outliers, we'll come to this in a moment, but the fact is there is some kind of relationship, and it's pretty robust, uh, between the size of non-competitive sector and your performance when you make a transition. So if your heritage is heavy, you cannot you know, escape from your 
uh, they say there is a French proverb, the more they see the leaf, so the uh, dead are grasping the alive, those who are alive. So your heritage matters. Yes, if you, if all your life you were doing such a reflect economy, you know, you just wake up on Monday and think you would do great in market economy. This is not the case. There will need to be some restructuring. Recession associated with restructuring is this one. Now, there is a second reason, though. And why there is a need for the second reason? Because, you know, I just showed you that in the uh, table, that uh, uh, in this table, you know, if fuel was so competitive, why the uh, output was falling in fuel, right? Why output was falling even in competitive industries? And uh, if you take this into account, if you take these distortions into account and run regressions, right? You will get the results and try to predict output using these regressions. You will get the results that China still performed better than expected, yes? And former Soviet Union performed worse than expected, right? So there is something about, uh, say, uh, uh, former Soviet Union and China, something that is lacking in China and uh, is present in the former Soviet Union, or vice versa, is present in the former Soviet Union, or lacking in China, that explains the difference. It's not only one factor, there should be another factor. One factor cannot explain. With one factor, you cannot make the right predictions. The other factor is institutional capacity. By institutional capacity, uh, all people use this word institutions. I mean, very narrow thing. You know, economists want to something that can be measured quantitatively, right? So institutional capacity is the ability of the government to enforce rules and regulations. That's the definition. Uh, it's my definition, I mean. The institution would be defined in all possible ways. But it's state institutions and the ability of the government to enforce your rules and regulations. Now, um, if the government regulations are bad, for instance, the government tax regulations, there may be unfair taxes, so taxes that are bad for the economic performance, right? Then it may be that uh, this is bad for the economy. But the question here is whether the government enforces them or does not enforce them. Whether the government has the power to enforce it or doesn't have the power. Is it bad regulations or good regulations? We'll come to that. This is a matter of policy, right? But policy should be enforced. Enforcement is measured by the size of the shadow economy. It's an objective indicator. And by the murder rate. Why not by the crime rate? Because the crime rate, crime statistics, depends very much on the statistics. Uh, crimes, in, uh, there are papers about it. In developed countries, crimes are registered better than in developing countries. So it depends very much on registration. But murders are registered pretty much accurately in all the countries. As they say in the uh, region where I come from, if there, is a, if there is a body, there is a case. If there is no body, there is no case. Right? So the, the murders are investigated. And murder statistics is pretty accurate. Three statistics are accurate. It's called external reasons of death. External causes of death are murders, suicide, and accidents. Right? And the statistics are pretty accurate. There are two statistics, actually. One is crime statistics, the other is medical statistics. When the doctor registers death, he writes a reason, the cause of death. And this is this and when two statistics coincide, right? And they do pretty much coincide. This is a pretty reliable statistic. So the government has a monopoly on violence, right? We know that the state is supposed to have a monopoly on violence. Monopoly on collecting taxes and monopoly on what else? Uh, uh, currency, right? This is the three most important monopolies, at least for the economists, right, of the state. If this monopoly on violence is undermined, if people do not comply, the state says, I can kill if we have capital punishment, and nobody else can kill. But if there are murders, then the monopoly of, or, on violence of the state is undermined. A, or the state has monopoly to collect taxes. You say, you don't pay taxes, you are, uh, it means you are undermining my monopoly, so you don't comply. So the size of the shared economy is the indicator of non-compliance. To what extent the government can enforce its rules and regulations, and to what extent the government can enforce its rules and regulations in collecting taxes, and then uh, monopoly on violence. Okay? Now, shared economy is estimated, there are ways, economic ways to estimate, looking at the electricity consumption, looking at the difference of unemployment rate and the ratio of uh, employment to able-bodied population uh, that can work uh, looking at the amount of cash uh, in the circulation, not non-cash currency, but cash in the circulation. So there are ways, objective ways. Some, mm, they are not very good, but you know, there is a paper for instance by Schneider and co-authors which uses five ways to estimate the size of the shadow economy. And it turns out that they get all the different results. Right? Every, every method to estimate the size of the shadow economy gives, gives different results. But basically there's kind of you know, kind of objective estimate here. So once we take these objective indicators about institutional capacity, we can measure, right, institutional capacity. And how institutional capacity affects performance. To give you one example, 
it raises the costs. Once the government is not doing the job in guaranteeing contracts and guaranteeing uh, um, property, these are property rights and contract rights are the most important for economists, right? Murder rate and uh, shadow economy are the proxies for the way that the government can guarantee property and contract rights. So uh, once the state is not delivering law and order, right, then your costs increase. Just to give you the anecdotal evidence, in 1990s in the Russian banks, uh, 50, not 50, sorry, every fifth, 20% of the personnel were guards. Guards were used not only to guard the property, but to collect the loans. Right? They're not collected, so the guards you know, show up in full demolition, and then the loan, they try to persuade uh, the people who don't pay the loan to, to pay the loan back. So, you know, 20% is too much. It's a lot of costs, right? A lot of costs. If costs increase, this is a typical supply side recession. Energy costs in the United States, 1973, the outburst of the oil crisis, 1979, more recently in 2008, 2009, oil prices go up. For the oil importing country, costs go up. Costs go up, what do you do? If you are an entrepreneur, you are trying to pass the costs on the consumers, on those who buy your product. So you increase prices. But you increase prices, you sell less output. So you have to cut the production. This is the recession. This is the simple story of the, you know, from the cotton famine. If you don't know what it is, when there was a civil war in the United States, there was a cotton famine in Britain. And British industry was raising textiles. And it went down. There was a major recession in Britain associated with that. So, you know, all economists agree that this can be the reason for the recession. And this is the story with institutional capacity. The institutions are weak. The companies have to take care of law and order, of contracts, of property themselves. This increases their costs. This basically suppresses your economic activity. This is a primitive explanation. There are other links also, but basically, if you have bad if your institutions suddenly deteriorate, economists think that institutions cannot, you know, they're pretty much exogenous. Right? Well, now there are a lot of papers that are trying to explain them from within the system. So they are trying to make them endogenous. But basically, they think that in the short run, especially institutions are falling from the skies. We cannot change them. But if in the short period of time they change, this is, by the way, another natural experiment. In social sciences, we cannot do the experiment. So we rely on natural experiments. And this is the natural experiment that is very interesting. So what do we have with these institutions? The picture is uh, very striking. Uh, the institutions, it takes some time for the pictures to change, but finally I will get there if I will be persistent enough. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, the story. The government revenues and government spending. Why revenues? Because if government spending are high and revenues are low, you have the deficit, which is not very good. Usually you cover it by printing money and then you have high inflation, which is so. Government revenues is the ability of the government to collect taxes. In Central European countries, the story was that institutions were pretty much in place. And uh, in countries like, uh, you know, Caucasian states or Russia, I'll show you the better chart for Russia. This is 89, 96. Basically, these institutions totally uh, collapsed because the state stopped spending money. This is Poland. Sometimes the uh, writing on the chart does not appear. I don't know why, but this is a mystery which is still needs to be resolved, uh, like the mystery of the transformation of recession. This, <laughs> Uh, is Poland, and we see that in Poland there was a reduction of the government spending as compared to GDP, but the spending for something which is called the ordinary government, this is the lower part of the chart, of the bars, right? This ordinary government includes everything except for something that does not affect institutional capacity. Well, to the best of the, our abilities to do the classification with the statistics that we have. So debt service, defense, subsidies, and investment. This is something that doesn't affect institutional capacity. And this is expenditure for social programs, for law and order, for, uh, uh, for police expenditure here, for, uh, for everything else, traditional fun functions of the government except for uh, this defense subsidies and investment. For government, uh, for education, for healthcare, for uh, social programs, uh, for uh, uh, enforcement of law and order, right? And, uh, and infrastructure also. No, investment are not here, so the current expenditure for infrastructure may be here, but if it is a government infrastructure, for instance, you run a bridge, right? But not to build a bridge. To build a bridge will be here in investment. So the regular government did not suffer. The GDP went down then up. In 1905, it was about the same. Uh, the Chinese story is pretty much similar. There was no reduction of the expenditure for the ordinary government. In the former, and in China, the GDP went uh, up from 1978 to 1984, from 100% to 300%. So the government expenditure were growing in line 
with the growth of GDP. So once you have, uh, say, one policeman here, uh, per 100,000 of population, you will have pretty much like one policeman here. In Russia, the GDP went down from 100% to 50%, roughly. Right? Well, to 55, but just for the sake of the argument. Uh, and uh, the government spending went down from, say, 20-something percent to 15 percent, right? So basically, the government spending in real terms went down by two-thirds. So you had three policemen, and now you have one policeman. Or you have the same three policemen, but you don't pay them. And we know what, what happens when you don't pay. The salaries are cut in three times, cut uh, by two-thirds, right? So everyone gets one-third of the previous salary. And then they try to replenish their salary by uh, the simple ways that uh, they have because they have weapons and so this gives them some uh, leverage over the you know, businesses and they can extort money from the businesses, right? So uh, this is the story of the government collapse. The story of the transition was not so much the story of the market failure. The story was 90% of the government, the story of the gov when the government goes from strong government to weak government, as suggested by the increase in the weather rate, as suggested by the huge increase in the shared economy. The increase in the shared economy was from, you know, 5 to 10 percent to nearly 50 percent in Russia, for instance, right? In the Gorbachev times, it was still 5 to 10 percent. This was a heritage of the Soviet system. You know, when the government was so rigid, there wasn't much of a shared economy. But there, the shared economy increased dramatically. So this is the story of the expenditure in, the, in, the, in Russia. You had over 60% of GDP expense because the government was paying for healthcare, education, for pensions, for everything, right? And then you have uh, the decline in expenditure by half, right, as a percentage of GDP. And GDP itself declines by half. So basically, it's the story that, you know, in real terms, your expenditure collapsed from 100% to 25%. Yes, they collapse um, dramatically uh, in a very short period of time. And once this happens, well, here we have decrease in the share of government revenues, and here we have performance. And it appears, well, that in those countries where decrease in government revenues was large, right, what is the decrease in government revenues in percentage points? It means, what is 50%? It means it used to be 35% and went down to 20, right? And so you have 15 percentage points decline in the share of the government. And in those countries where the decline was large, the recession was deeper. So output in 96 as compared to output in 89 was only 50%. China and Vietnam is again outliers. Now, I can go deeper in the story, right? And uh, there are some other measures of the state capacity. There are indices, all kinds of indices. Corruption indices from Transparency International. I'm sure some of those in the room use those indices in their research. Uh, most uh, people criticize them. All, all the people whom I know criticize them, but all the regional specialists, they say, oh, they, you know, for our region, they're bad, right? Maybe for the other regions, but for our regions, they're definitely bad. If you compare China and Russia according to this index, or you get the other index, this is World Bank Index of Control Over Corruption. They're all subjective, based on the opinions of the experts, right? Uh, here, China and Russia are at one level in 2005. Here in 2005, China is still higher than Russia, right? But of course, corruption increased in all the countries dramatically during transition. And uh, um, uh, if you take the, this is World Bank also indices, uh, if you take indices of uh, uh, the other indices, they, uh, they show you different things. So I, once again, I, I know the statistics, I can speculate. I have a paper on how you measure institutional capacity objectively and subjectively, and there are some biases that you can discover easily, right, in comparing those two. Uh, but the fact is that overall, these measures are linked, right? And so the big picture, you can argue about particular countries, but the big picture is, this is government effect on this index, and this is share of shared economy. So there is kind of relationship that we expect, right? So basically, with all the statistics that we have, we get pretty much the same story. And uh, the murder rate and the share of shared economy uh, as a percentage of GDP, uh, so uh, these indices are also linked, right? If you take away this outliers, you know, this is a positive relationship here. Yes, maybe on the chart it's not that obvious, but believe me, in regressions it comes as a very robust positive relationship. So the measures are basically linked. And uh, one of the uh, stories uh, of transition is that the state remained during transition relatively strong in China, authoritarian regime, and relatively strong in Central Europe, democratic regime. And in between, it was half democratic, half authoritarian. It became very weak. That's the story. There are explanations for the story 
I don't know whether I can get into these explanations, but uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, 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 just to give you some numbers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, these are the deaths from uh, per 100,000 inhabitants, the deaths from accidents, suicide, and murders. See, uh, in uh, uh, 2002, this was the highest point. In Russia, the murder rate was one of the highest in the world. Well, the murder rate was not exactly the highest in the world, but if you consider also suicides and accidents, then there would be deaths from external mm -hmm. causes. And if you take all the deaths from external causes, Russia was number one. And not only Russia was number one, but out of the 10 top countries, out of the 10 top countries, five were transition. Russia, Belarus, Estonia, Kazakhstan, Ukraine. <coughs> the other is Latin America or Sub-Saharan Asia. Okay. So the collapse of the state was very impressive, right? It's a very large part of the story. And the question is why in uh, China, uh, the state did not collapse to the same extent as in Russia, for instance. And why in Eastern Europe it did not collapse to the same extent as in Russia? Well, uh, this is a difficult question, and uh, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, there is a story how you do democratization. And when you do democratization, part of the answer is this equation. I don't know if you like the equations or not, but there is, <laughs> okay. Forget about it. Yeah, it's, I explain it in plain English. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, once you do democratization, there may be two effects. There may be vicious circle and virtuous circle. Once your rule of law is high, like in Eastern Europe, right, there is a virtuous circle. Your corruption becomes lower once you democratize. Your corruption, this is what we said. You democratize so you elect clean officials instead of, yes, uh, uh, not Tammany Hall type, right? But once your corruption was already high and you had a poor rule of law, you get a Tammany Hall effect. So you get into the vicious circle. So once your rule of law is low, like in China or in the former Soviet Union, and you democratize, and you get all kind of you know, expected, uh, unexpected results, right? So this is part of what you mentioned. But the other part is, uh, uh, is actually more intriguing. And it's more intriguing, you have to go to the long-term trends. Because you know, the, the immediate explanation is this one. Well, you were not supposed to cut your argument, to cut your government to the extent you did, right? And the economists uh, uh, usually think that, uh, okay, uh, that uh, uh, institutions, as I said, are exogenous, right? And uh, uh, they uh, cannot be, but government policy at least is something that can be controlled by the state, right? So the state has a choice to cut, to collect taxes, and to maintain police and rule of law, or not to maintain. To say, oh, you know, this is a wild west, or this is a wild east, you just, you know, protect your property yourself, right? Uh, so this is, if this is a choice, then the immediate reason was the collapse of the state. But the economist also has a saying, there is nothing more endogenous than the government policy, meaning that the government policy is determined by a kind of political interest. So it was not possible to avoid this kind of collapse of the state, right? Then, it's a reasonable argument, and I'm trying to explain it. And then I'm looking, at the medium term, and the medium term, wow, this is a, <laughs> animal. This is a spider, right? Oh. Wow. It, it's a good sign because I think the spiders are, uh, they live uh, with, uh, in, in a nice environment with good people, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, uh, the choice, uh, uh, the, this is the uh, question which is worth a hundred million dollars, this is uh, choice versus circumstance. Right? To what extent it was choice, to what extent it was circumstances. The argument that I'm trying to develop further, yes, I'll just say several sentences and I'll stop here because it's time already to stop. Sorry, I intended to stop 15 minutes ago. Now, uh, what is not known about China is that Chinese development was extremely successful in the Mao's era. Right? In the Mao's era, China was growing at 5% economically. You compare China and India. Well, this is the growth rates of China. No country except for Japan had such growth rates in, you know, 1960s, for instance. Despite all the great leaps forward, despite all the cultural revolutions, yes, once again, I, I was writing articles, and even I have a book on China, but it's in Russian, it's called Three Drops of Water. It's not only about economy, but about all the other things, including religion and politics and so on. Uh, three Drops of Water are in Chinese characters, right? The Chinese character that 
had that refers to something which is associated with water, like oil, or sea, or lake, uh, has uh, three tree. I mean, and those who speak Chinese probably know, they right? know that in Chinese the uh, character for the water tree yes, is uh, the great for the three drops. But anyway, this is uh, just the reference in passing. But the fact is that just uh, if you compare, for instance, GDP in China and India, India was full liberalization since 1947, since independence, right? And China was a rigid socialist, Maoist, central planned economy. And who was doing better in terms of life expectancy? And who was doing better in terms of GDP per capita? But basically, the answer is China. And there is a reason for that, why China was doing better. And uh, they say that the success of the Chinese reforms, then Xiaoping's success, since 1979, is based on a firm foundation of the achievements of the Maoist era. And what were the achievements of the Maoist era? Infrastructure. Liquidating illiteracy, total human capital was created, and strong institutions. Mao took the country with 5% government revenues in GDP and left the country to the then reformers with 20% of the government revenues. It's a problem. In developing countries, to collect taxes is a problem. So they had the institutional capacity. They had human capital, and they had way higher human capital than in India. Right? They were the same, at the same level in India and China. And by the end of Mao's era, in 1976, Mao died. China had life expectancy of 65 years. Mao took the country with life expectancy of 35 years, pretty much like in India, and left the country with 65 years. And India had a life expectancy of 50 years in 76, right? A little bit, 50 something years in 76. And the GDP per capita in China was probably two times higher than in India. There are different estimates, though. So the question is now if this is, so economic growth is like cooking a good dish, one more thing, yes? There should be several ingredients to receive this growth. The good cook knows, this is the comparison that I usually use, is that if you put a little bit more, well, not a good cook, but a bad cook knows that if you put more cinnamon and less salt, right, then you don't get the result. Right? Everything should be in the right proportion. For economic growth, you should get infrastructure right, you should get human capital right, you should get institutions right. In the agrarian countries, the, the distribution of land, land reform is important. Everything should be there. Then. Liberalization also should be there, because liberalization gives you economic stimuli. Uh, in Africa, you do liberalization, nothing happens. Why? Because there is no preconditions. Out of 23 preconditions are missing, right? And in China, there were preconditions. You add a little bit of liberalization, right? In fact, Mao's contribution to Chinese miracle was greater than Deng's contribution. Very controversial statement. I'm trying to be provocative. I'm putting the statement just you know, to, 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 to feel whether you, you get the, I'll get an argument back or I wouldn't get an argument back. But at least some people would claim that this is the case. So in uh, China, then Xiaoping adds a little bit of liberalization, and there is a spark. Right? Everything, you know, there is a chemistry. And the economic growth starts. Now, in Soviet Union, we're supposed to be the same thing. The Soviet Union also had infrastructure, had human capital. Thank you, thank you, socialist era. There were a lot of crimes in socialist era, but there were also something created. Why the baby was thrown with the water in the Soviet Union? And in China, they took the baby, put the water aside, and continued with the economic miracle, right? Based on these firm foundations. Maybe with this question, I will end, because otherwise we won't have time for questions, right? But let me just tell you that here we come to the medium term, and medium term performance was also, Chinese performance during the century of the planned economy was better than the Soviet performance. Soviet performance was great in the 1950s. This was the golden age of the century of the planned economy, when the satellite was launched and you know, the achievements in space. In the 1960s, it was also not bad, socialist with a human face and so on. And then it started, growth rates started to decline, 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 and finally declined virtually to zero in Gorbachev times. And in China, this was not the case. Their growth rate was 5%, even higher than 5% in late uh, uh, 1960s, beginning of 1970s, even though Cultural Revolution was in full swing. 1966-1976 is Cultural Revolution. Growth rate was jumping like that, but on average it was pretty high. And then they accelerated the growth rate when they made the transition to the market economy. Now, to understand why this was the case, you have to, uh, uh, to go to uh, the long-term uh, long-term uh, trends, to trends of 500 years. And the argument with the long-term trends would be that uh, uh, for the long-term trends, China, uh, during the period of communist, communism, returned to uh, the uh, 
to, to its trajectory of development, which was collectivist institutions. And once again, it sounds like a very provocative statement. I'm going to be happy to, to expand on it. Uh, but, uh, the, uh, but Russia, uh, for Russia, the, uh, just trying to, to find one chat, uh, for Russia, where is this glo global imbalances? Uh, for Russia, this was sorry. Uh, for Russia, this was the deviation from the trend. Russia was Westernized since Peter the Great, at least, and since the uh, 17th century Tsar Alexis, uh, uh, probably. So once Russia was Westernized, the communist attempt to return to collectivist institutions was a deviation from development, and then Russia returned to the previous trend. If it wouldn't have been for the Russian Revolution, Russia would be at best Argentina, at worst Colombia. <laughs> this was historical thing. But Bolsheviks tried to change it properly and successfully. Right? China returned. For China, the hundred years of humiliation after the Opium Wars, Opium Wars were in the middle of the 19th century, uh, this is when westernization attempt in China was undertaken. And it was unsuccessful. This westernization attempt uh, had total, complete liberalization. If you don't know, the input terrorists were eliminated altogether. The war was about you know, global imbalances, basically. The war was about eliminating the surplus in trade with China had. China had such a surplus in trade, here it is. Uh, because China was exporting everything to Britain, tea, silk, and Britain was not able to buy, to, to sell anything to China. It was self-sufficient empire, you know, the Ming Dynasty before, it was the Tsing Dynasty already, but the Ming Dynasty before that prohibited the construction of big ships. Uh, there was Zheng He, the famous traveler, 70 years before Columbus, if you know. A, uh, 14, 1430. In 1430, 70 years before Columbus, he nearly discovered America. This is not proven, but at least he was in an African corn, in Mauritius, in, uh, you know, in Indonesia, in all the Indian Ocean was uh, researched by, by the guy. And after that, they found out that there's nothing interesting in the outside world, and they prohibited the construction of big ships. And by the way, his ship was 100 meters long. Three times longer than the Columbus ship. It was only 30 meters long. This was 100 meters. And he had 50 ships, but mm, huge flotilla. Yes, with the horses they were traveling with him, with the stocks of uh, food in live form. Yes, there were, uh, there were uh, goats and uh, sheep yes, that were you know, carried out by the ships. So it looked very impressive. They discovered there is nothing interesting. They procured the construction of big ships, went into isolation, and didn't want to buy anything from the uh, outside world. So silver from Britain was flowing into uh, China, and Britain didn't like it. And the only thing the British could sell was opium, which was not even produced in Britain, but was produced in one of the colonies of Britain in India or in the China. And, and uh, then this opium was the British won the opium wars. The ports were opened. The uh, all offenses, uh, all attempts to. Uh, uh, you know, all uh, crimes against the foreigners were punished by death. Uh, the input duties were collected by the British authorities and were only 5%, ex-territorial authorities in the Chinese ports. Uh, so China went to total liberalization. And what was the economic growth in China for the next 100 years of liberalization? Zero. It was zero. And then what was the growth of external trade in China? It was pretty much like the growth of GDP, which was zero, right? So the share of foreign trade in Chinese GDP remained the same. And when the communists came to power, this foreign trade uh, started to grow. You wouldn't believe it, but the growth of Chinese foreign trade starts not with the damn reforms, but in 1970, in 1970s. In 1970s, Chinese, the share of Chinese trade in GDP increased from 2% Chinese exports in GDP to uh, uh, to 6%. I'm coming to this chart, I think the next one, yes, the next one will be. This is the share of Chinese exports in GDP, 2%, 1970. This is 1978, this is 1980. This was already 6 or 8%. In 10 years, China at that time exported ping pong balls and thermoses and you know shoes, rubber shoes and things like that. But the export was growing like crazy, under the center of the of money. Now I think I pose more questions than answers. So, you know, my uh, basic uh, idea, uh, I, didn't, I didn't speak much about the medium term, and I didn't speak much about the long term, but the long term trajectory explains, this is the uh, mixed fortunes, it explains why particular countries uh, go up and down. So let me put the chart on the, 
uh, in, let, us, let us come to the question. So thank you so much for your kind attention. So I need to do